update the late start. All right. So um, just a quick outline for today. We're going to talk for a while about what to grow in a high tunnel, some of the production specifics, um, specifically related to pruning and trellising, and then some of the things that we're learning can go wrong in high tunnels, especially in the soil, and how to avoid some common problems. So to start out, um, we have some just really kind of basic principles of what to grow in a high tunnel. We talked about this a little bit last week, but it's so important to identify a market before you grow anything. We get calls more than we would like to in the summer saying like, I have a whole high tunnel full of tomatoes. I have thousands of pounds of tomatoes. I don't know where to sell them. What can I do? And at that point, it's usually too late and it's a lot of stress and you've already put a lot of effort into growing something and you don't want to be caught in that situation. And so really understanding your community and the opportunities you have to sell something um, is really important before you choose what to grow in your high tunnel. In general, we want to choose crops that are profitable. Of course, that's true all of the time, but last week you heard about just kind of how much labor and expense goes into building a high tunnel. And so we wanna make sure that that space ends up being worth it for you. So typically that means crops that can be harvested continually. So things like lettuce that you're going back and making multiple cuts from, or cucumbers or tomatoes that you're harvesting every day. Or if it is something you're gonna harvest just once, like a radish or a carrot, something with a pretty quick growing season, so that you have opportunities to grow many things over the course of the season. It also means being really space efficient. And so in a high tunnel, that typically means being able to take advantage of vertical space. So things that can climb like tomatoes and cucumbers can be very profitable. Although as you'll see today, um, there are plenty of things that do not grow vertically that can also be grown in a high tunnel. Ideally, especially in the summer, we want to choose things that are heat tolerant. And we also want to have rotation. It can be really tempting to just grow the same thing over and over. Uh, we see this with tomatoes a lot, where people will just grow tomatoes every year. And that ultimately, um, well, it can work for a couple of years. Ultimately, people tend to run into problems. So we really want to present a diversity of things that can be grown in a tunnel today, ideally in rotation so that we can avoid these longer term soil problems. All right, so again, just like uh, Natalie was saying, uh, high tunnel space is expensive. We talked a little bit about that last week of just how much energy and, and monies goes into just starting the high tunnel. And then also putting the crop in is gonna cost some time and a lot of labor. So we wanna make sure that the crops we're growing are something that can have a high return on investment. Um, and this can be a lot of different things. And first and foremost, grow what your market demands. Um, you know, if you are able to get a really, really good price on watermelon, for instance, uh, and it's worth it to grow for you, you should grow watermelon. I'm not, and I'm not telling anybody to not grow certain things in, in their high tunnels. It's all going to depend on your market and what kind of price you're able to fetch for what you can grow. But generally, if we look at national trends, um, uh, for different vegetables and, and fruits that are commonly grown in high tunnels, we can see there's a huge discrepancy between some of, some things and, and other things. So this data is taken from the USDA ERS uh, website, and it includes uh, a number of different fruits and vegetables. I just took some of the highlighted ones that were kind of shows the, the most fluctuation between price per pound. Um, so if you look at blackberries, um, you know, you're probably going to be able to get a blackberry cane every foot in your high tunnel. Uh, a blackberry cane, I think, can produce one and a third pounds of berries. Um, so within, you know, a three foot square square footage of area, you're going to be getting around, you know, $15 or something. Uh, and remember from last week, the, the cost of that high tunnel per square foot really breaks down to somewhere between $1.50 and, and $3. So in that case, you're going to be doing pretty good. 
Uh, however, if you look at a watermelon, a watermelon is going to take quite a bit more space, probably, you know, maybe uh, five to six feet, and maybe you'll get two watermelons off of that plant. Um, and maybe those watermelons will, will weigh eight pounds, but still that's, you know, uh, per pound weight, you're still at less than $2 uh, or, or just over $2 per watermelon. And so you've grossed $4 per square foot, you, you know, and less than that, actually, because you're taking up more space. So that's something to think about. You can get around this in many different ways. You could trellis your watermelon up. You could uh, charge a higher price for it. Uh, but be conscientious of those those crops that require a little bit more space uh, and, and have a less uh, average dollar per pound sale value. Uh, we could do this with vegetables, too. Um, this is why tomatoes seem to always be a favorite is because their price per pound seems to be quite a bit better. This is the national average as of uh, 2016. I know I'm selling my uh, tomato, uh, cherry tomato pints for $5 a pint, and that's up in Grand Rapids. I'm sure folks down in the Twin Cities are doing a little better. Um, and I think I've got less than a pound in, in my pints. So you can see tomatoes are, are fetching a, a much higher price per pound than cabbage. And again, uh, I'm able to trellis those. And, and most folks who are growing tomatoes can trellis and really advantage that space, whereas cabbage is kind of just spread out. And you're, you're kind of stuck with what you got. So those are some considerations to think of. Again, go with what the market is demanding from you uh, and, and what's also in good health for your, uh, your high tunnel and good rotation. There's many, many different options. Um, and getting those rotations down is, is really what can help. Right. So when we talk about, when we think of high tunnel crops, we often are just thinking about summer. Like the main things that come to mind are tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers. But there have been quite a few studies now of high tunnel growers kind of in cooler climates in the Midwest that find that the people who are really successful with high tunnels are the ones who really take advantage of those shoulder seasons. So the times when you're less busy, there's less supply of fresh produce, um, and you can really get a premium for products that are not really available elsewhere. And so really investing in spring and fall and winter crops can be a really good strategy for your high tunnel, in addition to thinking about summer. So in the spring, um, this is a picture I took from a farm in, it would have been early May. So we, you'll hear more about this 100 Farms project later, but our team went to 100 farms this spring with high tunnels, and most of them were totally empty in May. Like people were not quite ready to start planting their tomatoes yet. And so we just had these bare high tunnels all over. But this was a really great example of a farm that had invested in cool season crops in their high tunnel. And on May 1st, I had this beautiful tunnel full of chard and spinach and mustards. Um, so all of those cool season leafy green crops are a really great fit for spring. They can be harvested before your main summer crop. And they really give you that kind of early market. Um, a lot of people also like to grow things like carrots, beets, and broccoli, or even broccolini, varieties that are really fast to mature. With all of these, there's a really wide range. You can grow like a 50-day carrot, or you can grow an 80-day carrot, and so variety selection is really important for those early season um, crops. And then things like peas, spring onions, turnips, radishes, and you may find that you have to supplement with some row cover. Um, on really cold nights. So the thing about high tunnels is they give you the season extension. We generally are experiencing warmer springs, but we're still experiencing really cold freezes in the spring. And so being prepared for that is important for high tunnel success. Um, I have been to many farms in the spring where people kind of overestimate and maybe plant their tomatoes a little sooner than might be recommended and then a hard frost comes and they don't make it. And so being prepared for that is key. Eric, do you want to add anything about spring crops? Yeah, this is another way to, to make the tunnel work economically for you. 
Um, you know, a lot of times uh, it, on the last last week we talked a little bit about utilization of space, um, and you can actually you can go over a hundred percent utilization from these rotations. So if you are planting in between uh, your tomatoes and you're doing some lettuce early, and then you're doing tomatoes, and then you're doing something else afterward, you're getting really good utilization on your space, getting a, um, good economic returns from that. Um, I think one uh, other thing is a lot of people will want to plant their tomatoes and their um, peppers a little too soon. Just keep them in the greenhouse, pot them up into bigger pots if you have to. Um, they're not going to do anything uh, if you put them in that greenhouse and it's too cold. They're just going to sit there. Um, so use that time for some of these cool season crops. Yeah, great points. All right, so transitioning into summer. Um, is where we want to choose really heat tolerant plants. High tunnels are really hot environments in the summer and things that can be continually harvested and trellised to take advantage of that vertical space. So um, tomatoes are kind of the obvious choice. The first thing that most people grow. Other things in that family that tend to do really well in high tunnels are peppers and eggplants. Cucumbers are probably the second most common high tunnel crop. Um, We've also seen people start to have a lot of success with day neutral strawberries in a high tunnel. So these are not your perennial strawberries. They're treated more like an annual crop and they're harvested throughout the season. Um, we have people who are still harvesting strawberries well into the fall. So that's um, kind of a fun, uh, different thing to add that can be really profitable um, and that customers really like things like green beans, um, and then a number of crops that like we just can't really successfully grow outside in Minnesota because our growing season is too short. So there are quite a few growers who have had success with fresh ginger. Um, sweet potatoes are another crop that people have found to be surprisingly profitable. And then there are some that are a little more questionable, like turmeric often gets thrown in with ginger. Um, Eric and I both visit a lot of farmers and we don't know that many people have been really successful with turmeric, but there has been more success with ginger. Anything you wanna to add to summer crops? Um, and I think this will be a good segue going into fall crops. There is kind of a, uh, a point of marginal returns with some of these. So like your pepper plants are gonna flower, they're gonna give you lots of peppers. And you might, you know, very well be able to get another pepper off of those guys, but it's going to take a long time. Um, and it's hard to do. Us as uh, farmers, we we really bond to our plants and this is really hard to do. But sometimes you're economically better off ripping that pepper out and putting some lettuce in in that space. You're going to get more dollar return doing that, even though it is hard to rip your baby up after all that work that you've done that's uh, throughout the summer. And that's a great transition to talking about fall and winter crops, because this is always the dilemma that um, that there's a lot of value in growing fall crops, but sometimes it means tearing out your summer crops before they're ready. So one of the things that is becoming a lot more common in Minnesota is to grow um, leafy greens for winter in unheated high tunnels. Um, so growing spinach that you would pl plant in September and harvest in February. Um, if you've ever had Minnesota grown February spinach, it's the best spinach you'll ever taste. It's really sweet because of the cold, um, but it needs to be planted 10 to 15 weeks before the Persephone period. So that's the period where we have less than 10 hours of daylight. And that usually means planting in early September, which means if you're growing tomatoes, pulling your tomatoes out before you're really ready to do that. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, and again, something that's really dependent on markets. Um, if you're gonna do this, additional row cover is usually needed. Um, and I will also say people grow all of the crops that you might grow in the spring in the fall as well. Um, and the other thing I always want to plug about winter, because we see so many empty high tunnels in the winter, is that it's a really great time to focus on your soil health and plant a cover crop. Um, and we'll talk a little more about cover crops later Early, on. 
Yep. Kevin Guas, Tutti Frutti Market Farm. I've looked on the internet without success. I'm trying to find some way of getting a wireless thermometer alarm that would tell me if your tunnel is suddenly way too hot or way too cold. And I have yeah, not been able- Yeah, we can follow up with you in the, um, in the comments. There are a lot of different temperature sensors you can use in a high tunnel. I'd like to find one because you know that it works for both the spring and the fall. If you yep. get an unexpected cold snap in either one of those, I um, mean, you don't see it coming, then at least you got some sort of backup if you want to add heat for a day or so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Kevin. we can come back to that and we can, we can. I, link I, I use Govee, G O V E E. Uh, check that out, Kevin, I, and we'll talk about it later. I can set you up with, with that. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Is there anything you want to add about fall and winter crops? Um, uh, Asian greens are wonderful if you got a market for it. They're so quick. They're like 35 to 45 days, um, and they thrive in that cool temperature. Um, uh, yeah, just kind of grow a market. And a lot of times I've noticed that, uh, especially folks that are a little more rural like me, if you can team up with someone who's doing a winter CSA market share box and then put your greens or your, your loose leaf lettuce or spinach in there, that works really, really well. Usually those people doing the winter CSA are doing more root vegetables and potatoes and things, and they would love to get some fresh greens in there. Yeah, Carl asked in the chat, like, are the winter greens, um, forgot how you phrased it, are they a way to, like, maybe they're not the biggest money makers, but you're making some money. I think part of it is like just keeping your customers engaged, mm -hmm. making those like winter and fall boxes a little bit more appealing. Um, I, I always make fun of radishes. Economics of winter spinach. Uh, it's not bad um, if you have a market, if you can sell it. Uh, usually you can charge a little bit higher uh, than what you could in the summer. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, I think almost anything makes sense because there's just not a whole lot of anything else growing at that time. Spinach is by far going to be your most profitable. Um, but you know, I've grown radishes before just to have some variety in the fall and, and they go over well. So even though radishes are, you know, the quintessential cheap vegetable. And Allison and Alex are asking about what we mean by additional cover. So that would be a row or a, um, a layer of row cover. And that gives you a few extra degrees of warmth, um, for those cool nights. That's something you can buy in one of the produce catalogs. They're usually not too expensive. If you're a redneck and hack it like I do, uh, you can use like old um, tarps uh, and you just have to pull them off because there won't be any light coming through. Um, even just uh, maybe you, you got some extra plastic putting up your greenhouse, you can roll some of that over and that'll help get you through those few cold snaps. Yeah, and that works for like the really cold nights, but for continual production, you can buy from... You can buy from like any seed company or any supply company, um, like a spun bound woven row cover that you would actually keep on for the season with little hoops um, or just over the top. If you put plastic, you have to remove it because that plant can't breathe and it's going to it's going to die. Yeah. So in addition to the annual seasonal crops, um, it has become increasingly common to grow a couple of perennials in high tunnels. Um, so at this point, raspberries are really the most well-researched perennial to grow in a high tunnel, um, specifically primal cane or fall bearing raspberries. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to doing this, uh, higher yields. There's uh, maybe some evidence of supporting spotted wind drosophila management. There are people who are growing other things in tunnels as well. And I know people are always really interested in like, can I grow peaches? Can I grow apricots? And the answer is yes, you can. There, there are a couple of people doing this. It may not be the most profitable. It is going to require a lot of experimentation. And so it's not at this point, something we really recommend that anybody do. If you're like really interested in it, um, our fruit educator, Madeline, could work with you. But generally, 
raspberries tend to be kind of the the go-to most reliable, most profitable perennial. Um, I put strawberries on here too. They're not really a perennial. They're grown like an annual in a tunnel, but it's another fruit option. And we've got this bulletin that we can send out at the end about um, raspberry production and high tunnels. And so ideally you would have a multi-year crop rotation. And this is where it can be tricky if you only have one tunnel. Um, last week we talked about like, what is the right number of tunnels? And that is gonna be different for everybody, but having a couple of tunnels does give you a lot more opportunity to rotate your crops. And so this is just kind of a, an example rotation for your main crop for the summer that maybe one year you grow tomatoes, followed by a cover crop. The next year you grow cucumbers with a winter spinach crop. The next year you grow day neutral strawberries. But in reality, most people are not gonna have a single tunnel dedicated to an entire crop. Um, that's just like not necessarily the reality of markets. So Eric's gonna share at his farm what it more realistically looks like. So I have the, the problem of having one really large high tunnel. And had I gone around again, I probably would have gotten two smaller ones. So the rotation would be easier. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm driven by the economics of it. I am very tempted to put tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes. Um, and I got away with that for a year or two. But now I'm kind of seeing, seeing some of the signs of, of why that might not be a very good idea. Uh, Anyway, I'm I'm usually able to get quite a few different crops out. And, you know, when you're faced with that challenge of getting uh, just having one tunnel and trying to rotate, I've just gone by rotating on rows. So typically half my tunnel will be in tomatoes. And so it'll be on the left hand sides, all tomatoes this year. And then I'll switch and that'll be on the right side that year. And then I'm going to grow cucumbers, peppers, eggplant, other stuff on that that other side. Um, but eventually you're going to run out of options. Uh, and, and so it's it's uh, good to have a, an arsenal of different things in your uh, uh, in your growing arsenal. So um, this year I did some winter sowing of spinach. Um, so hopefully that will come up in the spring. I've done that in the field with really good results, and so I'm thinking it'll it'll work in the tunnel. Um, oftentimes we will start seeding, you know, end of April, even. We pushed it to mid-April this this last year, and I think I could have even pushed it to the first of April, um, sowing in direct sowing um, loose leaf and head lettuce. And we're able to usually get uh, a good good couple cuttings of loose leaf lettuce and spinach, um, and then sometimes I'm even able to get uh, some decent sized romaine heads of lettuce. Um, and sometimes I'm pulling them out when they're they're small, not ideally large like I would like them, but. It's, it's they're still going to sell. It'll be fine. Um, we're putting tomatoes or peppers or cucumbers in typically like mid-May. Um, and uh, then in, as as I plant those, I will put um, dill or uh, uh, um, parsley or basil in between the, the tomatoes. And I, I don't do that right away. I wait till I've pruned up, pruned up quite a ways. So they're a little bit bigger. So maybe mid-July is when I'm doing that. Um, and then in the fall, uh, for things like peppers and eggplant, I'll rip them out usually September 15th and put in little clumps of radishes or, or turnips or, um, uh, you know, other cool season loving crops. Uh, and then, um, usually that dill and basil is, is just done and, and then I can seed, um, uh, lettuce in there. So those are kind of what I've done and had success with. Um, uh, I've been able to get good sales early in the spring and then late into the fall on some of those crops that, you know, I wouldn't have had otherwise. All right, thanks. Oh, and then you had some lessons oh, yeah. learned. Right, so, um, and again, I'm I'm not gonna tell anybody they should or shouldn't grow anything, uh, but in my experience in my high tunnel, I've had a few epic fails, um, like this uh, decorative corn here. And, and, you know, it really wasn't, too much of a epic fail as far as growing. I mean, these things got 13 feet and then they kept pushing up on the high tunnel. So they grew really well. Um, but it just wasn't a very wise use of the space. Um, I got one harvest of these sweet corn or these um, Indian uh, decorative corns. And then that was it. 
Um, and uh, for sugar snap peas, and, and I do know a gal who grows wonderful peas in her tunnel. And uh, she has a very, very well um, ventilated tunnel. Uh, and she's growing these on the shoulder seasons too. But when I when I first did it, I put it right in the you know right in the growing season, and they um, they actually got uh, dehydrated peas in the shell before I could even pick them. So that was not great. These these guys did not like the heat and didn't do well with it. Um, I've had the same with kohlrabi. Kohlrabi tends to stress out under heat and it just won't grow. So I had you know the same size little knob of kohlrabi for a, a good month and a half. Um, uh, it's same with some of these other ones. Uh, Brussels sprouts, I'll tell you, um, they do actually grow fantastic in a tunnel. They grow great. Um, but, uh, you know, a very, very large, you know, a, a three foot tall uh, stalk of Brussels sprouts is going to be really hard to sell. Uh, and the Brussels sprouts that's, you know, maybe like a small cabbage is not maybe going to sell the best either. And okra was a tremendous success. I had wonderful okra, but I couldn't sell it. Up here in northern Minnesota, nobody even knew what it was. So that was more of an economic or, or marketing error than a, than a growing error. But I, I do know of people growing all of these things with good success in a tunnel. You can do it. Um, it just doesn't match your market and doesn't match the space uh, that you have. We have someone asking about... Um beets and someone asking us to go back a slide. So I'm just going to show this and have you talk about when and how you use beets in a tunnel. Sure. So um, I'll put in beets, you know, that end of April, like the 29th or something uh, of April, 30th of April, uh, put beets in and they're usually small, uh, but but adequate. They'll sell and you're you're going to be the first person at the market with them and, and they'll go like hotcakes. Uh, people will be very excited for them. Uh, one of my students um, does pickled beets, and she's got a strawberry farm. So she raises these uh, very early, and they're big and beautiful by the time people come to pick strawberries. And so they can also load up on on beets and whatever doesn't sell, she cans into beet pickles. I should also mention with uh, carrots, too. Not all carrots are created equal. Some carrots are like 85 days and some are like 35. You got to get the early varieties. The late ones, there'll be nothing there by the time you need to put your tomatoes in. Um, all right, let's move on to trellising. So trellising is another way to save space, but it's also a great way to get higher quality and even more yields on your fruit. Um, so why we would trellis is so you, for your own sanity, walking through a greenhouse that looks like this is a lot more stressful and cumbersome than walking through a greenhouse or a high tunnel that looks like this, uh, where it's nice and organized and the fruit is easy to see and pick. Um, if you kind of think about the microclimate around a, a, a unpruned tomato, there's a lot of foliage, there's a lot of humidity in there, not a whole lot of sunlight or wind uh, getting through there. And that is like the ideal uh, environment for fungi and other pathogens and insects to hang out in. So when you prune, you're also decreasing uh, the likelihood of uh, disease and pathogen outbreaks. It also is just much easier to harvest and, and see what you have there to harvest. I Probably a lot of us have looked under a tomato plant that hasn't been pruned and found you know, a whole nest of rotting tomatoes uh, that they just couldn't see previous. Um, you can also get your fruit mature faster so the, the fruit can ripen a little bit quicker. Um, you kind of have to think like a plant. So a plant doesn't really, uh, the plant's main focus is to grow and be healthy. And as a once it's healthy and, and fine, then it will say, okay, now it's time to, to grow some fruit. Um, but if you hack off those leaves, you're going to kind of tell the plant, oh, geez, this is this is a, a stressful situation. I better reproduce, which means I better produce a fruit. And so you can kind of trick your plants by pruning into fruiting earlier uh, and fruiting more often. Um, you can also prolong the, the harvest season this way too. Um, and just if you have better pruned fruit, uh, and this can go for tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, even peppers and eggplant, you're gonna have uh, a bigger fruit size and better quality. So some of the things you're going to need for trellising are some tools. There's uh, these uh, uh, tomato twine is what it's called, but 
the here, but you can use whatever, uh, you know, you can use it for things that aren't tomatoes. Um, these are rollers here, and these are holders. Um, and both of these are mobile, so you can kind of move them down as uh, the as the plant grows. And I'll show you why that might be important in a minute. And then there's these wonderful tomato clips, and you can use them, of course, on cucumbers or what have you, um, that you can get at a garden store. They're fairly inexpensive. Um, and whatever you're thinking about ordering, just double it because um, you will run out of these very, very quickly. Uh, before the use of these, people would use like, um, if you can use strips of cloth. If you don't wanna buy anything like an old t-shirt, you can cut it into strips and use it to tie. Um, but this is gonna save you a lot, a lot of time. There's two basic ways to prune tomatoes or cucumbers. Um, there's the basket weave. I think I've also heard it called the Florida weave and then doing an overhead trellising where each plant has a string attached down to it. So the, the Florida weave or the basket weave is basically if you are using like cattle panels or an existing structure, and you're just basically maneuvering that, that vine up uh, and weaving it back and forth between that trellis system. Uh, this is nice if you have like a permanent area uh, in your, in your um, greenhouse, um, and especially if you're doing things like those those perennial um, uh, strawberries or um, uh, raspberries, the primal canes, uh, this is going to be nice for you. Um, otherwise, most folks are using the overhead trellising system. Uh, most of the time, you take this down at the end of the year uh, and, so you can get in with the tractor or whatever. Um, and and this, is, this is a nice way to do it, too. Um, I'm really cheap and I have wonderful workers that will go in and uh, actually remove every little clip as we take the tomatoes off. So you can reuse those. Um, you should be a little cautious about that because it can spread some disease and pathogens, but um, these they're, they're designed to throw away, but you can reuse them. And I'll just say, I think this ties back to last week's webinar in that if you are planning to do trellising from the roof of your high tunnel, you need to make sure that your high tunnel is designed for that. Not every high tunnel has the right structural support to be able to do this. If you think of the weight of hundreds of tomato plants <laughs> pulling down on the roof of your tunnel, um, that's something to think through before you decide on which tunnel you want to build. That's a great point. If you can imagine a a tomato fruit that's been well pruned and cared for in peak season is going to have about 30 pounds of tomatoes on it, uh, plus the weight of its its stem and all that. If you have 100 of them in your high tunnel, you can do the math. That's a lot of weight. So uh, be conscientious of, of that. Um, there's a couple other ways that you can trellis, uh, prune and trellis your crops in a high tunnel. There's the lower and lean method. This is a great space saver and body saver. Um, Typically, you know, uh, us farmers are really getting sore and cranky in August, um, and a lot of that has to do with climbing ladders to pick cherry tomatoes and all that other stuff. Um, the lower and lean method uses those um, roller hooks and, and holder hooks uh, that can go down like a, a, a purlin that's on your rafters, and basically you're going to slide your tomatoes down as they grow and lower them uh, down to the the ground or just lower. What you want to do here is you want to have really good prunage and you want to have your fruit at like a test height harvest. Um, and that's actually the best place as far as airflow and heat goes in your tunnel. Um, you know, I've had uh, cherry tomatoes that go up and then over and down again. And so I've got tons of cherry tomatoes way up here in the canopy. They're hard to get um and uncomfortable to get and they're they're molding and splitting faster just because the the microclimate up here isn't as good as it would be down at chest height so uh the lower and lean method allows you to have those uh fruits right at the the right growing temperature height and the right uh height for harvesting so it's a nice nice thing to think about doing if you're doing the basket mm -hmm. weave you can't really do this uh the that pruning All right, so I know it's already 6.20. We started a little late, so we're running a little short on time. Um, but we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about 
just some of the really common issues that we see in tunnels and how to think about managing in a way that allows you to avoid these problems down the road. Um, I do want to acknowledge there are quite a few people talking about varieties in the chat. Um, just as like a general rule, seed companies have gotten really good about like labeling things that are well suited for high tunnels. Breeders are breeding things that are specific to high tunnels. Um, and if you all have variety recommendations you want to share, feel free to put those in the chat as we go along here. So, and I'll try to wrap this up. Um, we might go a little bit over, um, but I'll try to wrap up by about 6.30. <laughs> we might have to skip a little bit. Um, so I think I mentioned this last week that more and more people are getting high tunnels and we frequently hear from growers this issue that like for the first few years, things look so good. People are so happy with their high tunnels. And then there seems to be this kind of productivity decline that happens. And so we wanted to better understand why that was happening. And so we had a team of extension educators go and visit 100 farms this spring and do soil tests in high tunnels and in fields to compare the differences that we were seeing between those environments and try, try to understand like what are some things that might be driving um, issues in tunnels. And so one of the things that we saw um, was that the soil pH in high tunnels tends to change over time. So there's this really sweet spot that is a pH of six to seven. Um, so just a little bit acidic. And that's where plants are best able to access nutrients. So even if you have a lot of nutrients in your soil, if your pH is above seven or too far below six, your plants may not be able to access them. Um, and we did see that high tunnels tend to be really over fertilized. They have a lot of fertility in them. And yet we still see plant deficiency symptoms, plant nutrient deficiency symptoms. Um, and so what we found is that the longer a high tunnel has been in production, the higher the pH is. So this is something that is happening. We suspected it was happening and we found that it was happening. And there are probably a couple explanations for this. Um, unfortunately, like one of our hypotheses was that it's our irrigation water, that our water tends to have a high pH. Every single farm in this 100 farm study had water with a pH that was too high and with high alkalinity. The fact that every single person had water with a pH that was too high meant that we couldn't compare, like what does it look like when a farm has an ideal pH compared to one that doesn't because everybody's wasn't ideal. But we think that that's one of the drivers um, of this problem. The other thing is that people tend to add a lot of inputs to their high tunnels. There's this idea that it's this high value space, you're asking a lot from your soil, you're producing a lot from your high tunnel, and so you must be depleting the nutrients. And we see that people are really overcompensating, that nutrient levels are way higher in high tunnels than they are in the field, and they're a lot higher than they need to be. And so when we're applying a lot of salt, or when we're applying a lot of compost and composted manure, we're applying a lot of salts to our tunnels. Um, and we saw really high levels of calcium in high tunnels. Um, and so, that accumulation of salts may be contributing to the pH. And it also means um, we've seen evidence from high tunnels elsewhere that when calcium levels get too high, it can prevent the uptake of other really essential nutrients like potassium. So we're kind of over fertilizing and then we're irrigating with water that has a pH that's too high. So some solutions to this, one is to test your soil often and only apply as much fertility as you need. So not overdoing the manure, not overdoing compost. And then focus, your soil health is still really important in a high tunnel, but we can build that in other ways. So using cover crops, reducing tillage. Movable high tunnels are a really cool solution <laughs> that are maybe not applicable to everybody. They're more complicated to build. 
they're more susceptible to wind damage, but there are some really cool examples of movable high tunnels in Minnesota. So they're on, you can kind of see in this picture, they're in a track system where you move them every year along that track and allow rainwater to come through. And then another thing that more and more farmers are doing is acidifying their soil or water, either through the application of elemental sulfur in the fall to the soil or by adding acid to the irrigation water. And unfortunately, we don't have time to like go <laughs> way into acidifying irrigation water today, um, but we're developing some resources about that. A second problem is the buildup of soil-borne pathogens. Um, and we see this in fields, but it's something that we really see in high tunnels. Um, often probably because we're growing tomatoes over and over again in the same tunnels. And so last summer, or I guess the summer before, um, there was this Midwest survey that the USDA did of high tunnel soils. There were only three Minnesota growers that participated, but in all three of those tunnels, we found persistent soil-borne pathogens that were contributing probably to yield loss. So we are seeing verticillium and fusarium as well as root knot nematode in high tunnels. So what do we do about that? The first is just kind of basic practices. Crop rotation is so important. So as much as we can be finding other things to grow in high tunnels, that's probably our best tool. There's basic sanitation. So Eric talked about pruning and trellising to get good airflow to reduce disease pressure, removing infected plants, making sure you're going into your high tunnel every couple of days and scouting your plants. So looking like every 10 feet or so in your rows, just taking the time to look at your plants. While you're pruning, look at the vascular tissue, make sure it looks healthy. And so as you're scouting regularly, making sure you're identifying problems right as you see them. It's usually too late by the time everything looks bad. So you wanna find those problems right away an extension or the plant disease clinic can help you figure out what's going on when you see something that doesn't look quite right. There's also, this may be an unpopular opinion, <laughs> um, but there is such a thing as too much organic matter. I think we sometimes see tunnels where people are using deep compost mulch and applying like three to four inches of compost every year and organic matter getting up to like 10, 12%. And some of these pathogens that live in the soil inherently thrive on decomposing organic matter. And so by having that much organic matter, you've created a system where you constantly have decomposing organic matter and it becomes really hard to manage these pathogens. So we see like bottom rots and lettuce and root rots. So just having balance and kind of taking a more holistic approach to soil health versus just dumping compost on every year can also be something that helps. Um, and then another thing which ties back to variety selection is that if you know which pathogens are present in your high tunnel, you can choose varieties that have resistance. Um, and some growers will even do grafting with varieties that are really specially adapted to have good resistance to soil-borne pathogens. Um, and I put Marissa's picture and email on here. She's our IPM specialist. So she helps people with insect disease and weed issues. And so if you're having issues with soil-borne pathogens, she's someone you can reach out to. And I'm gonna skip this for now because we're running out of time. <laughs> and end with one final problem, which is just that high tunnel soils get really dry. Um, and especially when we have a lot of organic matter, when we're using a lot of compost, when we're transplanting, so we're introducing a lot of potting soil, those materials can actually become hydrophobic when they dry out. So they repel water. So once they dry out, it's really hard to rehydrate them. So we've seen a lot of examples of just like really kind of dried out high tunnel soils that are really hard to rewet. And so you're irrigating. And that water is just going straight through. And so finding ways to maintain, you know, you don't want your tunnel to be wet all the time, but maintaining some soil moisture is really important. 
We can do that with cover crops. So not leaving our soil just bare is one really important strategy. Um, when we are adding compost, mixing it into the soil a little bit versus just leaving it on the surface can help with the compost getting dried out. Um, irrigating sometimes in the winter, that might seem counterintuitive if nothing's growing, but just kind of keeping the soil from getting to that bone dry point. And then when it is time to replace your plastic, it's not convenient to do this every year, but consider maybe leaving that plastic off for a season. Um, and we'll send this out. I put a little flyer in here about a, an opportunity for farmers to get involved in a winter cover crop trial in high tunnels. So we're really, really enthusiastic about using cover crops and keeping that soil covered. And so we're pretty much on time. <laughs> we're gonna wrap up there with the formal presentation and we can stick around um, and answer questions. So just kind of a recap of what we talked about today. Make sure you're planting things that are high value. Ideally, they're things that are really space efficient, they're things that grow quickly, but most importantly, have a market before you're planting something in a high tunnel. And then take care of your soil. So be careful about adding too many inputs, especially things that are high in salts. Focus on those, like they're harder, they take longer, but those kind of fundamental soil health principles of keeping the soil covered using cover crops, reducing tillage, rotating, and maintaining soil moisture. And so I put just a couple of things here, our fruit and veg newsletter. Um, and we have a lot of soil health resources and high tunnel resources on our um, Extension Small Farms YouTube channel as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing. We can reshare if we have to go back and look at something. Um, but we can do some Q&A. How should we do this, Eric? Have you been kind of monitoring it as I've been talking at um, the end here? There's good good chats going on. Um, I think there was some, some talk about um, hover crops. And, and I think I just like to reiterate, they're, they're so useful because we're seeing really, really high um, phosphorus and potassium uh, in tunnels. And typically most of us are doing things organically or organically in practice. And that means we're using a lot of manure and manure tends to have really high phosphorus and potassium levels relative to the nitrogen that you're getting. But cover crops can really solve that. They can provide a lot of that nitrogen without giving you all the potassium and phosphorus. Um, they can help with rotations. It's just trying to find that that happy medium, that balance between growing something profitable and growing a yeah. cover crop. And it, it is difficult. I, I struggle with it too. Um, but we're we're working on that and hopefully we'll have some some kind of recommendation or an idea of what what works. So just one really easy, quick technical question. People are wondering about when you'll have access to these materials. So just like last week, Matt sent you an email a couple of days after the webinar. I think, did you do that, Matt? <laughs> or did, okay, with the recording and the slides. Um, so he'll do that again next week. We'll send the recording and the slides and some resources. Um, Any questions out there that you guys would feel comfortable asking uh, the whole group here or... Um... Other things that stood out or stuff you want us to review in the slides? I have a Thanks. question. Yeah. Um, so I'm a farmer who has, I only have one hoop house and very limited growing space on my farm. And um, I also, uh, my farm was run by other farmers before me. So I think there's probably been tomatoes growing kind of like in the same spot for like the last four years. Um, and I'm just like, would love to hear more about kind of like when you guys talk about like um, noticing signs of like built up pathogens and disease in the soil. Like, can you talk about what that looks like? And like a little bit, a li just a little bit in more detail. Um, I think, like, I understand that I 
shouldn't be growing tomatoes in the same spot again, but I'm like waiting on another hoop house and just like kind of for when you're super not in an ideal situation, like if you have any recommendations just to like help with that. Yeah, really good question. Um, so sometimes certain pathogens will be really obvious to see. Like it'll be like the picture on the left where you've got yeah. spots on the leaves and things just look really wrong. Sometimes things will just look like generally a little sad, but not in a way that's really obvious. Um, so I think when you're pruning is a really good time to look because you won't necessarily see spots on the leaves, but you might see in the vascular tissue. So that's like kind of that ring of brown that you're seeing in the picture on the right. Ideally, when you're pruning, you want to see like green, <laughs> healthy, um, not dried out looking stems. And if you're seeing things that look kind of dried out, especially in a, like the, the vascular tissue, so like the veins almost of a tomato are gonna be in a ring around the edge. And if that is looking brown or dry, that's a really good sign that there might be something going on and where you might wanna send a sample to a disease clinic. Um, the other time is like at the end of the season to look at the roots and see if the roots look healthy. So the roots should look white. They should look like they have plenty of moisture in them. If they're looking kind of brown and dried out, that's another sign that there might be something going on. I would say those are kind of the main ways. To give you some context, like the, the vermicillium and fusarium root rot, that can persist in the soil for four years. So a rotation of at least you know three years is going to really help with that. If you keep feeding it tomatoes, which it loves, uh, every year it's just going to grow more and more and more and more. Wow. So there are quite a few questions about um, cover crops in a high tunnel and which cover crops to grow. A lot of the same cover crops that do well in fields are going to do well in high tunnel. Uh, I'm going to just type a link here in the chat. Let me quick remember what it is. <laughs> so uh, this z.umn.edu slash vegetable cover crop. Right. Um, that's a guide we made to growing crops specifically in Minnesota vegetable production systems in these different windows. Um, there are a lot of growers that just grow like rye, like cereal rye in their high tunnel in the winter, or they grow buckwheat. Um, and it's some of the same ones. If you want to have a legume to give you some nitrogen, some popular cover crops are peas, usually mixed with oats, um, vetch. I've seen quite a few people grow clovers in their high tunnels, like crimson clover. Um, and if you're interested, this study that we're doing, you can sign up and you'll get free cover crop seed and you get to try it on a really small scale in a community with other growers. So it's kind of a nice way to like dip your toe in and see how it goes. Let's see. There was a question on how to terminate a high tunnel. Um, you can cut it down, mow it, or uh, Andrew was saying you could put either black plastic or or even clear plastic will kill it. Um, for for me, um, yeah, I when I when I mowed uh, a, a part of my uh, a tunnel with the the cover crop in it, uh, and then I went directly behind it and tried to till it to till it in, that wasn't all that great. I would let it kind of cook for a couple of days and dry out before you try to incorporate it, um, especially if you have a really heavy stand of like rye or something. Uh, rye is also a wonderful cover crop because it grows and grows and grows. Um, but there's other maybe more polite cover crops that'll actually die when when they're supposed to, like oats and uh, things like that. Uh, buckwheat dies, which is nice. Um, like rye tends to just keep going and going and going. It kind of becomes a weed uh, if you don't don't kill it real real fast. There are a couple of questions about high tunnel tomatoes and what 
varieties are people's favorites. And a few people have responded um, with some of their favorite tomatoes, big beef, Estiva, Sakura. Uh, Sun Golds are kind of like the go-to um, sweet cherry tomato of a lot of high tunnel growers. I'm going to put one of my favorite resources in the chat here. Um, so every year there's an organic vegetable production conference in Madison, Wisconsin, um, where they choose a crop and they have different farmers present about how they grow that crop. Um, and they do high tunnel sessions and like people's favorite varieties are listed in there as well as so many details about how do you prep the soil? How do you start seeds? When do you plant? Like, how do you deal with every kind of minute detail of growing this crop? Um, so it's a really cool resource. And they have high tunnel cucumbers. They've done high tunnel tomatoes a couple of times. And so you can get some good upper Midwest variety recommendations from some really experienced growers just by looking at that um, resource. Lindsay's asking about um, the resource with companies. I think you mean for like building a high tunnel or buying a high tunnel. And that's in that high tunnel guide. We can have Matt send that out again with the recording. But on one of the final pages of that guide, we have a list of all the different suppliers of high tunnels that we know of in the Midwest. As far as people to install them. I'm not too familiar with uh, them, although um, Andrew, there is a guy that uh, is up and coming. Uh, I think his name is Rodrigo. He's kind of a handyman and he might be interested in helping you construct your high tunnel. Um, Russell shared in the chat, um, just some comments about pruning that the basket weave system is really better suited for determinate varieties, whereas the lower and lean is meant for indeterminate varieties. And typically in a high tunnel, we're growing indeterminate varieties just because we're really trying to take advantage of height and the extended growing season. An indeterminate tomato will continue to produce, it'll continue to flower and fruit throughout the season, whereas a determinate tomato makes that shift all at once from vegetative to reproductive. Um, development. And so you get like a big flush of tomatoes and then they're kind of done, but they don't grow as tall. So if you don't have a high tunnel that can really support trellising a really tall indeterminate tomato, um, those basket weave systems tend to work better for determinants. Yeah, this is a great comment if you guys want to read about pruning from, from Russell. Um, you can do what's called two liters or one liter. So on your typically your indeterminate tomatoes, you can prune so that you have two uh, branches going or two main stems going up. Um, and uh, yeah, pruning on the indeterminate since they kind of just grow and then they fruit and then they're done. You want to be a little bit mindful of pruning on them. You don't want to necessarily hack them too much. Uh, where on those indeterminates, you can really, really take a lot off. Um, so just a reminder, Matt put in the chat a link to a little survey if we we're struggling with Zoom polls. So if people are willing to fill out a quick survey. Thank you, Natalie. I'm going to drop that again right here. And it also includes, just to let you know, a uh, the very last question is if, like, if you think of another question afterwards and you're like, oh, shoot, we're those awesome experts. Uh, you can, you can fill it out there and Andrew, um, has agreed to take some time to, to get back to folks. Uh, Andrew's everyone that that's on this call has been awesome, but, um, that will be in there and I'm going to drop it once again in the chat right now. So please do fill that out. This was a grant funded project. I mean, some of it was at least, um, but it was, uh, this call was in part enabled through this. And so anything you could do to, to contribute would be awesome. There it is. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Maddie is asking about suggestions for flowers. Um, I, I'm really sad to say that like extension is really not in the flower game. Um, I wish we had better resources and people who know more about cut flower production and we're just not there. But 
Um, Will and thank you for sharing some suggestions. Will Ellen has had success with sunflowers, zinnia, and asters, status, and snapdragons. Eric, do any of your students do flowers in high tunnels? Uh, I got a couple that are starting. Um, uh, some folks are trying to get that lily market, uh, the white lilies for Easter. Um, you, and lilies do well in tunnels. You can even grow them in like potted um yeah, well, pots, I guess. Uh, and then you can get a pretty pretty nice fetch, fetch a nice price for them uh, pretty early in the season. Uh, but no, that's, uh, I have a gal doing dahlias in tunnels. And your Alyssa shared some, some farmers to look at. Green Light Farm, Northerly Flora. And that's actually another really good um, a question, honestly, to ask seed reps, like the major seed companies have Midwest specific representatives that know their seeds really well, and they can be some of the best people to ask about variety recommendations, um, including for flowers. It's hard for us to keep track of like every single variety that people are growing, but that's their entire job is to know what varieties are performing well for people. So definitely take advantage of those people. Don't just like flip through the catalog and choose something like call your rep, ask for suggestions. So all the like high mowing, Johnny's, um, Stokes, I don't, Holmes, all of those seed companies have Midwest reps that can help you think through good varieties. All right, we're getting lots of flower suggestions. Thank you. Uh, there was a question on what growing zones can you create in a high tunnel? Um, well, kind of whatever you like. If money's not an object and you can just heat and heat and heat. Um, I don't know, Natalie, what would you say? We're, we can get another zone, a zone five. Maybe, I don't know if there's like a, a specific, you can go from this zone to this zone. It depends. I think I'm still... I guess I still am I'm not going to recommend that people are growing certain like that really is most important I think for perennials and I'm I still am not in a place where I'm going to recommend that people are growing peaches in high tunnel people are doing it you can do it is it going to be profitable is it going to be as straightforward as some of these other things probably not <laughs> so, I, so I'm kind of hesitant to do things based on like zone recommendations Anything else? See, there's a lot of interest in flower farming. We will continue to, <laughs> to nudge our, our leadership to invest in some people who work with flowers. Oh, I have a comment about flowers. Um, there's, I just, I'm participating. Well, actually, well, it hasn't happened yet, but hopefully um, myself and a professor at the U of M and a few other flower farmers are going to receive a grant, an MDA demonstration grant this year that will help us like basically grow some flowers and the U of M is going to grow a bunch of them and do some tours and stuff. And like, hopefully they're trying to like, you know, work it more into the system, get some more knowledge out there and collect, hopefully you can collect some more um, information for everybody, but for sure, reach out to those flower farmers listed. They've all, I think, participated in farm beginnings through the land stewardship project. And I think are excited and willing to share information. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Alyssa. Um, Russell's wondering about extension trials on um, high tunnel crop varieties. Um, sometimes there are. <laughs> there, it sounds like some, is it Neil Anderson, Alyssa, who's doing the flower varieties? Um, no, it's Mary Rogers. Oh, cool. Okay. 
Yeah, and Mary's done some work with um, strawberry variety trials in high tunnels. Um, we have some pepper, like bell pepper variety trials from high tunnels. The One of the places we typically post that stuff is in the Midwest variety trial reports. So that's a database from across the Midwest. Um, but that's something to look at. And then we'll typically post in our newsletter too as research comes out. So which months should we start growing um, greens like lettuce and such? Eric, when do you typically plant your lettuce? I was just reading Andrew beat me to it. So I usually start mm -hmm. in mid-April and he usually starts in mid-March. So that's the range, guys. Um, and are you direct seeding or are you transplanting? I am direct seeding in mine. Um, and then uh, the warm season crops I'm I'm doing from, uh, you know, transplant. But those are early in the spring. Yep, direct seeding. Is that what you're doing, Andrew? Direct seeding on those early spring crops? Yeah, I'm doing direct seeding. Um, I can do radishes as, as or as early as the last week of February. Wow. You know, a friend of mine last year who lived very close to me um, planted planted her tomatoes uh, on like early April. Uh, she had a couple floating row covers, and they made it. I don't think they were very happy. Like, I don't think the tomato gained anything by sitting there uh for like a month but it didn't die so i guess that's kind of cool i've also seen tomatoes die <laughs> in early may in a high tunnel <laughs> so just because it's been done once doesn't mean it's the best yes yeah yeah if if you're going that early like you know like what andrew's saying please buy yourself a floating row cover because you're going to lose a lot of work um, on those cold snaps if you don't have that. And Will, and you bring up a good point that it's it's not just about the heat, it's also about daylight. And so if you start too early, your plants can get stressed because they're just not getting enough light. So I'm curious, Russell, Set. Russell asked about replacements for Corinto cucumbers. And Corinto is kind of like the go-to high tunnel cucumber. It's um, it's parthenocarpic, which means <laughs> and gynoecious. So it only produces female flowers and it self-pollinates. And so that's really important in a high tunnel because it can get too hot for pollinators to be really active. And so um this variety was like really specifically developed for high tunnels and most people really love it. So I'm kind of curious to know why you're not loving it or why you're looking for a replacement. Yeah. So I, uh, I see that it has more susceptibility to cucumber beetles and other uh, fungal diseases. And when I first started my high tunnel and part of it could also be the high soil pH too. I know that's part of it, but, um, my first couple of years, I mean, I had plants and transplant four, three or four week transplants. And within a month I had fruit and I had fruit the remainder of the season all the way until October. And then it kind of dwindled from there to the point where if I'm lucky, the plants aren't mostly dead by July. Okay. Interesting. So I would say. And, and it's mean, because of the disease pressure and the cucumber beetle pressure. And I'm sure maybe the pH together. I mean, there, things are working together towards the detriment. But just a thought. I was just trying to see if there's some other varieties out there that might be better now. So my hunch is to say that like choosing a new variety might not fix the problem. It may be that you just like have some disease pressure built up in your high tunnel. And also that um, like you may want to try exclusion netting for cucumber beetle. We had a picture of that food farm does that. There are a couple of farms that do it where like on your roll up sides where they'd typically be open, you actually put a layer of insect netting. Um, yeah, and then so getting to the root of the disease issue, like taking some samples so you know exactly which 
disease is, is present. And then considering like a rootstock and grafting your cucumbers onto something that is really specifically resistant to what you're seeing. Okay. And I haven't planted anything in that tunnel for cucumbers for three years now. And I am doing an upgrade to that tunnel. And that's one of the things I am doing an upgrade is exclusion insect netting on okay. all access points. So hopefully that'll help too. But yeah, yeah that's I'm kind of there is a trade-off yeah. with insect netting in that you're not getting quite as much airflow. Right. And so you you want to make sure you're adding extra fans and that you have like really good ventilation in place. And I might have further questions for you that on, on that because I'm looking at putting automated louvers and fans, louvers on one end, fans on the other with temperature controls. But we can talk about that later. But I'm looking at what what kind of needs you have for a tunnel for that kind of a situation. But yeah, that's just yeah. kind of where I'm headed. Okay. And people did share a couple of varieties. Gail grows Socrates and Unagi and is happy with those. Other people feel free to share your favorite high tunnel cucumbers too. Currento is definitely not the only one. Just a common one. Um, Lindsay's asking about the best time of year to test your soil. Typically, people do it in the spring or fall. Um, I really like soil testing in the fall because in the spring, there are like thousands of gardeners testing their soil and sending it to the soil lab <laughs> and they can get a little bit more backed up. There's just like so much soil all of a sudden. And so it can take a little bit longer, but also if you do it in the fall, you have more time to like actually look through your results and make a plan and order the inputs that you want to use. So it's just easier than doing it in the spring when you're already really busy and scrambling. Um, but I mean, you could do it right now too. Like if your soil's not frozen, especially in your high tunnel, you could go out right now and take a soil test. Lots of people like market more 76. <laughs> That's something that Natalie and I can help you with. Like ideally you should get your soil test. And I, I know, and I was like this too, you know, you get your soil test and you look it over and you're like, huh, okay. And then you never think about it again. Um, it's, you know, it's something that you probably want to process a little bit and probably do some math with uh, to figure out what you really need as far as fertilizers go. Um, and, and we'd be happy to help you with that. I love geeking out to the, to those numbers and finding, um, different fertilizer sources that are, will work for your tunnel. Yeah. And like, don't stress yourself out about it. There's a whole network of people that can support and it, it can be really overwhelming. Like math is not intuitive to most people. <laughs> it's like there are people who will sit down with you and help you come up with a nutrient management plan. So don't feel like you just need to like, I don't know, look at your soil test and be like, oh, it's too complicated. I don't know how to make this translate into my system. Um, there's a lot of support. Right, well, it looks like people are kind of dropping off. Questions are slowing down. It's almost seven o'clock. <laughs> so maybe we can wrap up here um, at seven. And you'll be hearing, you'll be getting an email from Matt with some more resources. We're around, feel free to reach out. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Natalie, uh, for leading this this part of it. Um, and Eric and Andrew, uh, yeah, I really appreciate y'all. Thanks for organizing, Matt. For yeah. sure. Thank you, interpreters, and thank you for everyone to everyone for coming back after you got kicked off. Yes. Appreciate your persistence. Russell, I'm wondering if you might have a spider mite issue too. Um, yep, I, yep, that's that is something that's happened. Um, okay. Yep. Okay. So, it's, um, it's and it's not dry. always the same issue either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, spider mites. I guess I I forgot that one.
I lost everything to, or well, not everything, just my cucumbers, like mid August to spider mites. So, yeah. I think I, everybody has spider mites. <laughs> <laughs> um, and being proactive with biocontrol can be really effective. There are predatory mites that you can release in a tunnel. And actually, if you're using exclusion netting, it works especially well to use biocontrol. Um, I, yeah. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to try a few of those options. I know I was reading something from Ben Hartman and Lean Farm online, and, and um, he uses Corento. And he um, was, he got to a point where he determined that grafting wasn't his best use of his time. Mm. What he yeah. and mommy, what he ended up doing is doing a tr uh, succession planting of cucumbers every three weeks. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, he'd get one up and growing by the time the next one was producing that next one he'd take out. But mm. I kind of wonder if he was putting those in different tunnels too, because I tried that one year and it just, you know, then it just spreads to the transplants and the transplants can't even handle the pest pressure then. So, and he, and he, he, he probably maybe don't have the same issues as me either. So it's hard to say, but I just know he had, he was just doing that to alleviate any kind of disease and production issues, but that gets expensive at a dollar a pop for a seed. So I think they're about a dollar a seed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, crafting crafting can be expensive and time consuming, but that also sounds expensive and time consuming. Yeah, yeah. I, I and do a lot do of growers who graft on a larger scale will um they'll buy pre-grafted tomatoes or they'll like okay. outsource it. Um just because there are people who are really good at it. <laughs> and yeah. people find that it like the the labor to cost yeah. ratio can be worth yeah. it. Yeah, I, I I I do my own grafting, but I don't I don't won't say I'm very efficient at it. <laughs> yeah, I don't lose too many plants, but it takes me a long time to graft a hundred plants. Yeah, I think it takes me about I think it takes me four hours to graft. I think about a hundred plants, if I remember right. So 